wanted to tie for you a pheasant tail crawdad. I've been working on it for a while, just trying to tie out a myriad of flies just using the pheasant tail, either the rump or the rest of the feathers. And I recently saw a crawdad similar to this done by Gunnar Brammer, and this kind of moved me to, to start this kind of fly. Anyway, what we have here is a Gamagatsu J20. Um, dash B, which is barbless, in a size 10. The thread is Vivas Tenot in black. I've got some B chain eyes. These are large. I actually don't know what size they are. I just, um, I go to the pull chains in the hardware store and find the largest ones I can find and in black and silver and gold, and they're really cheap. So I just figure eight these eyes up on the front there. You can notice though that the eyes are on the outside of the hook, not in the inside. That's to facilitate it landing with the hook point up. So I'll do a figure eight and then I'll wrap around and then I'll also add some uh, super glue. Now take my thread, tie it back into the back. I'm gonna tie in my antenna first. And once again, this is just from the uh, pheasant tail. Now I've already um, pulled all my feathers and I've got it held in that foam piece of foam. You'll find if you do this you tie much faster. So I prep all my feathers before I tie and it lets me tie multiple multiple flies and have all my feathers prepped and it goes much faster than having to stop each time. Now I extend that antenna probably another half length of the of the hook, hook shank either half to three quarters. What I'm trying to do is to get the darn thing this this fly is targeting carp and I've got to get enough area on the fly so that when we when you lob it into it 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 doesn't splash and that's what I'm trying to do with this. Now this is the inner part of my claw And you'll notice that I've cut a V out in the front of that feather. That's to simulate more look of a claw. You don't have to do that, but I it's just something I add. And I do it on one side, and then I'll flip over and do it on the other side. Funny story, a friend of mine, I asked for him for some pheasant tail and pheasant tail rump. I've got a couple, about three or four lifetimes of it. A buddy of mine, Jerry out of um, Nebraska, him and his son, Jake, Jay. All right, so I've done the rust, and now I'm going to go on, on the outside of it, outside of that claw with the uh, olive. Please note also that I'm using B chain eyes and not a weighted, not weighted or leaded eyes. That's so that once again it doesn't splash as much. You're not really casting when you cast a carp in a river or even on a on a lake. You don't blind cast for I at least I've never had any success blind casting for carp. It's more like sight fishing for them. So you gotta really play the game. Because they're pretty, they've got to be probably one of the smartest fish. So I've got both of my uh, my inner and outer claw, and I'm right above where the um, barb of the hook would be. Now I've gone ahead and prepped some feathers. I've taken some pet feathers off of the uh, pheasant tail rump, 
And these are those iridescent portions. They're either blue or they're green. And I put them into a uh, clamp. And we're going to make a little dubbing loop here. Now you'll see how long those fibers are and where I'm putting the thread. Historically, you would put it further to the butt end of it. But what I want to do is actually fold the, as I wrap it, I'll fold it. And so what it does is it gives me more mass on the body with those butt ends, how long those butt ends are. Twist my dubbing loop. And then I'll preen the fibers backwards as I wrap. And just make concentric wraps, just butt it up against each other. It's funny, but this is just a, turns out to be a very, very buggy fly. And sitting on the bottom of a lake or a river, if you can place it right, it, it, it will get a lot of attention. Now, I've also got a little blue, blue-gray as well as green in this brush. So I really like the color. It's so variegated, you can't beat it. There's nothing in nature that's just straight one color, and that this really shows that off. Now I'll wrap that. I'm going to bring it pretty much back behind the eyes, but I've left a little bit of space. I'm going to put a, an additional brush because I want to build it up a bit more. Now I'm gonna make a I've got another I want to make another dubbing brush out of the same stuff out of the feathers on a pheasant tail rump. A little bit of wax. If you have noticed, you can see that I also have a little bit of tubing at the end of my hook for my dubbing loop. And what that is, is I don't like those really wide spaced ones. I like, the, I like that wire there, but that little plastic tubing splits the hair enough so I don't have to fight trying to split the hair. Once again, brush it out, create the dubbing loop. Yeah, you can see that little piece of tubing right there on the hook. Now I'm using that CNF hackle pliers. I love those things. That's the one pair of pliers that things don't, don't get loose on me. I can actually put three or four stems of a feather off my pheasant tail and hold it. What I've done is I've gone one time behind the eyes and then I'm figure eight, figure eighting the uh, rest of that brush through the eyes and to the tip of the hook, right behind the eye of the hook. Now it gets a little messy in here, but just persevere a little bit. It, you'll be able to brush back, pull back the, uh, preen back the, the fibers and get your bodkin in there to tie off those feathers. So I've gone in, I figurated through the eyes and up to the front, and I'm just preening back the feathers. What I'm gonna do is see that little tuft that I keep pushing back? I'm going to take some UV resin and 
nail it down so that when it lands, it'll land on the eye, on the on the bee chain. Basically, the fly's done right now, but I've got that tuft of hair, and if I just left it like that and it landed, it was you know it still fall over. So what I do is I take that hair, print it back take some of my UV resin and apply it right at those fibers. And it soaks through and holds them down. So the bottom part of the fly then is the are the bee chain eyes. So I get, you know, it doesn't always land perfectly, but it will here most of the time. And just hit it with my light. Fortunately, it penetrates far enough to get down into there. Now I'm using a laser, <laughs> mainly because I know the darn thing's powerful enough, and it's, it's cheap, cheaper than even the flat UV flashlights you can buy. Now I'm just cleaning it up so I can actually thread the the uh, fly onto my onto my uh, thread, uh, excuse me, tip it. And I'm trimming it to clear a little bit of a path for the eye of the hook. Now I've got some gunk, because that's the technical term for it, in the eye of the hook. And so what I do is I'm going to apply a little bit of um, super glue to nail off that front end and then I'm going to take my hot bodkin and burn out the rest of those fibers. Now this uh, cauterizing tool I'm using, I don't buy it from the fly shops. I buy it from Michael's, and it's half the price. So we're talking $11, $12 versus $20 plus. And it's the same darn thing. And this is called the Thread Zap. Thread Zap 2. And it takes one AA battery. And that's basically my uh, pheasant tail crawdad. I'm just fussing right here. Thank you.